Good evening, everybody. I'm Brian Mallow, and this is But Seriously with Brian Mallow, oddly enough. And if you know me at all, and I think some of you do, if you know me at all, you know I'm really into insect photography. Um, and I'm always going to say this. Of course, I mean photographs taken by insects, obviously. What else could that possibly mean? And, um, you know... I'm not a scientist, I'm not an entomologist, but I've been taking insect photos for a long time and uh, I've gotten to know some things, but fortunately I have entomologist friends that I can rely on and, and I do. And so sometimes when I can't identify a bug, my go-to guy, cause he's right here in Raleigh and he works for NC State. Um, why don't we just go ahead and, and, and bring him on. Hey Matt, um, are you there? Come in Matt. Yeah, hey Brian, how's it going? Um, great. So Matt Bertone is an entomologist and an insect photographer. Both, you get both. Um, I those go hand in hand pretty often, don't they? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, if you want to see your subjects up close, it's really great to be able to get really good photos of them, and they often don't sit still, so it's good to review them afterward, right? Yeah. And like I think of Alex Wild as uh, just another guy we know who is a great entomologist and great photographer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. A lot of people out there. He was one of my inspirations to get into this kind of more hardcore SLR photography and whatever. Yeah. So I want to ask you about all that, but let me start with um, uh, what is your official title? You know, when we met a few years ago, I was working over at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and who were you working for then? Because you weren't an employee of the museum, but you were working on a on a project and did some of your work at the museum. And you know, you say a few years, you know how long it's been. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's been it's been ten years since, since I then moved we here. met. It's, yes, I since don't know, we met. <laughs> where does the time go, especially these last I know, couple of years? I know. So I was working uh, as a postdoc for Rob Dunn and Michelle Troutwine, uh, and I was working in the lab of Roland Kays, who does the, uh, um, I forget what his lab is called. It's the... Um, it's the biodiversity. Biodiversity, lab. yeah, biodiversity lab. And uh, so, yeah, that was that was really great. Yeah, and you were working on the arthropods in our home project. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Because let's at least talk about let's at least talk about my selfishly fascinating little tidbit uh, with that project. Because you came into my home seeking arthropods. <laughs> I did, and we I think we found some. I know we found you some. Did. And uh, what yeah, was that the was the... what, what is the project? What was the arthropods in our home? Are it still going on? Uh, it's not going on now. Uh, we we basically wrapped up the project back then, and uh, the the whole idea was to go into fifty homes in the Raleigh area um, and collect every arthropod we could find, live or dead. Uh, then go back and sort it, and just see if there was any pattern uh, and exactly what was there. You know, anything yeah, unknown, yeah, anything known. Yeah, were there some surprises? Were there some maybe you should say you want to give the hierarchy of why is it arthropods instead of I, I guess let me put it this way. Give me the hierarchy about bugs, insects, arthropods, and arachnids. How do those mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, to just the regular person, uh, bugs is probably fine for all of them. Uh, right. I even use critters or things like that. It's kind of a general term kind of for any kind of, quote, creepy qual crawly um, with lots of legs and whatnot. But really, uh, most of those things are arthropods, which is the phylum, which is like the big group. Uh, and that, that contains a lot of things out there, basically all over the earth. So everything from insects on land, to spiders and mites, but also all the crustaceans. So the crabs and lobsters and shrimp, even barnacles are arthropods. Um, so lots of leggy jointed, uh, things without backbones with an exoskeleton, they shed their skin, uh, things like that. So that's arthropods. And then within arthropods, there are some groups. Uh, one is arachnids, which is basically uh, the spiders, scorpions, mites, uh, uh, things like that. They have eight legs generally. They have usually modified pedipalps and whatnot. They never have wings. They never have antennae. And then you get over on the insect side, and technically insects evolve from crustaceans. 
uh, but insects have antennae, many of them can fly, uh, and they're much more diverse than all the other arthropod groups that we know. Uh, of course, many are yet to be studied, so. Right, and you said insects, all insects come from crustaceans, so cr are crustaceans are older than insects? Aren't insects a pretty old, what do you call, is it an order, is it a, what are insects, is it a? Yeah, so uh, that's it gets tough there. Right, it, it was, okay. It's a class. It's a class of arthropods, but we also now divide some up. Um, I won't spoil anything, but we have a photo of a non-insect hexapod in uh, in this set, and uh, these are things with six legs. A hexapod. They have antennae, but they're not technically called technically insects. Oh. It's it's right, a new so thing. That, yeah, really? yeah. We can talk about that when we get to that. But you but know, basically, would, yeah. yeah. So, they, so we, we we're gonna come. So if, if I didn't make it clear, we're gonna look at a lot of great insect photos today. And and the thing I love about Matt is that is that uh, it's not just the great photos. It's like pretty much any insect, Matt has something interesting to say about it. And what I was asking you before the show was, you, like you you're an entomologist, and as far as like within that, you're also a, a systematist. Which yeah. Is, what is yeah. that? So systematists or systematics is kind of the study of how we organize nature. Um, and it includes things like taxonomy, which is naming uh, of things and giving them names and classifying them. But then systematics is kind of also brings in how they evolved, how different uh, organisms evolved from each other or from common ancestors, basically, uh, to like lots of biological and biodiversity data. So it's kind of um, just understanding the diversity and how nature is organized. Yeah, and um, so we I, we welcome comments and um, <laughs> I don't know if we're always going to have an answer to these. Fred Bothwell asked, how many tons of spiders total are in all the laboratories today? Oh, yeah, we didn't finish the reason I asked you about the arthropods in our home. Um, but um, he also wonders, could you grow spiders in cargo containers? And can you ranch spiders and grow a metric ton of them? Um, I don't know if you have to take them all as serious questions. Sorry, Fred. That's 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 my take on your questions but yeah, um, I, i'd like to see you try i'd like to see some you know some a good uh, effort in growing yeah. a, a ton of spiders in a cargo container uh you you have to stay inside though with them that's that's the <laughs> caveat <laughs> well when you came it was really cool to watch you guys when you came and explored my house and just to go along every crevice you were looking for dead bugs live bugs anything you could find and you were finding like people would be surprised how many species are in an average home. Like, I'm not even, a, uh, I don't think I was a pet owner at the time, but later I had cats, but I don't even think I was a pet owner. And you find like 50 to 100 species in a home? Yeah, yeah, that? on average about 100 species, but, but many of them were um, coming from the outdoors, dying inside, but there were plenty of them that were healthy and thriving. Isn't and that just what the humans are in, in your home. Isn't that just what we're doing too? Aren't we coming from the outside and dying pleasantly inside? <laughs> What's the difference? I don't get it. Um, so you found in 50 homes in the Triangle area or in the Raleigh area, there's a, one native species around here is the black widow spider and you found one black widow and it was in my mm -hmm. basement. And yep. and tell me what happened. I Because I forgot the rest of the story. You took it back to the museum lab and kept it alive, right? Uh, I forget with that specimen. It's been a long time, but I forget whether we preserved that specimen or not. You uh, kept it alive, but I don't it... think it lasted that long for some okay. reason. Okay, no, yeah. You wanted to, I remember because you were keeping I've it alive, kept but too I don't many, think it lasted. I've kept too many black widows in my life to, to, to tell, to remember anymore. <laughs> oh, so... Here's a, Fred has a bunch of questions, but here's one from uh, Jennifer Han Rennie. What about the newest giant spider that falls from the sky that's now mm. on the East Coast? What can you tell us about that guy? Do you know anything about that? What is that? Well, the guys are actually tiny, so, or small, but the the lady spiders, the, the Joro spiders, the one that they're talking about, is not going to drop from the sky 
the whole thing that that's related to is how the young balloon and many spider young balloon. And so uh, there are no large spiders dropping from the sky. This is this is kind of <laughs> to get get media headlines. And I've been trying to work with some people to get some better messages out. Uh, and there's some really good people out there giving good messages as well. Um, you know, very tempered messages that this is not going to go kill everybody. It's not dangerous. Uh, we don't know ex exactly what's going to happen with its range in the east, but uh, there have been a few specimens found alive in North Carolina already. Uh, and it, but it's been in Georgia since 2013. So just around the time we met you, I met you, the spider was actually here already. So, oh, wow. you know, we don't really know a lot about what's going to happen, but it'll be here. It's big, uh, kind of scary, but also really beautiful and uh, basically harmless, though. So if okay. you ever see those big, if you ever see those big black and yellow garden spiders, it's going to be like that, basically. Maybe a oh, little bit well, higher up in the trees, things those like are that. pretty intimidating. Oh, you just casually toss yeah. that off like those aren't the most intimidating spiders that are, I regularly are you, encounter. Are you scared of them when you see them? Are you scared of them when you see them? Well, I mean, no, I am taking them back. There. And <laughs> what about sometimes they don't just sit there? I've seen them do this thing. Do you know yeah, what I'm Yeah, that's because you're freaking them out. Because you're freaking them out. Where they make the web go back and forth. Is that what? <laughs> do you know what what that behavior yeah. actually is? Yeah, it's it's to it's to scare you so that you leave because they don't it's they're working. scared of you. It's yeah, working. okay. <laughs> it's it's way more scared of you than you're scared of it. I mean, that's that's oh, how it works. <laughs> this is hurting me more than it hurts you. You know, the funny yeah. thing about that is that that. You know I love insects and I'll handle a praying mantis and a lot of other mm -hmm. bugs, but I'm still a little squeamish about spiders where I'm like, oh, they're a little creepy, even though, help me help me with this. Like, I shouldn't mm -hmm. worry about picking up almost any spider, right? I mean, uh, you know, if it's big enough that it could bite you, you're, you're, what you're doing is kind of bothering it. It'd like be if you, if you got picked up by a giant, you know, you may feel one way, you may feel another way, you may bite the giant, you may not. So, you know, I, I tend to myself personally, I know that a lot of people hold spiders and especially pet spiders and things like that, but uh, I tend to watch them from a distance. I only hold them if I need to kind of catch them and let them go somewhere. But, uh, you know, it's stressful for the spider more than it is for you. And so, uh, you know, I just recommend observing them from distance. But spiders are really intelligent, really, really uh, observant animals that kind of know what's going on around them. And so, uh, you know, th but they're not out to get us. That's that's the bottom line. Um, Kevin Smith uh, says good evening. And and uh, and uh, yeah, oh, thanks for tuning in. Kevin, Kevin. Smith. Great. <laughs> um, hey, so wait a minute. Y so. How smart and aware are they? Like, what do you know about that? How do you know, what do you have to say about spider intelligence or awareness? Can you elaborate well, on that at all? Yeah. Well, some spiders are really intelligent. Um, There's some jumping spiders that are, in fact, there's this one species that hunts other spiders and it uses different hunting strategies depending on what spider it's hunting. So if it's an active spider, it, it comes at it from the back. If it's a web spider, it lures it down from its web by pretending to be prey. So some spiders are very intelligent. Uh, but I think, I guess my opinion is because spiders just seem more aware of people. They're, they're kind of, you know, they'll turn, many jumping spiders will look at you, you know, yes. you know turn their head and look at you. Yeah. And they're observing you too. So, and jumping spiders are kind of the, the, kind of the ultimate in smart spiders. But, but spiders... I've even yeah. heard of tarantulas doing things like, uh, you know, um, cleaning up their cages and things like that and, and, and yeah. things that you don't because associate with the spider. Because someone was coming spider. over. They yeah, probably. Over. You, know, you know, they wanted to, yeah. <laughs> Jumping spiders are so cute. And there's, mm -hmm. there's two things I'd like to ask you about. One is very often... A little tiny jumping spider, it's like they definitely seem aware, like it'll be on my car or something. Uh -huh. And I actually feel like, well, I'm going to drive. I'd like to scoop you off the car. It's for your own good. And But, but like, they'll do this thing where they raise these. They'll, they'll let's see if we go, like, uh, they'll, like, raise these, uh, raise their front little things. And they're like, like, like he's threatening me, like. Like, like I couldn't just step on you and end this, but they seem very bold for their size. That just seems amazing. And then um, one time, you know, 
The first camera I had with a macro lens needed really good light. One time I caught a little jumping spider. It wasn't bright enough out. So the next day I was in Golden Gate Park and it was really cute because I, I sort of put it down on a cement bench and I wanted my camera right on his level, right on the bench. But every time I put the spider down, it came running right towards me too fast for me to get a good picture. Like it wouldn't stay there. It seemed to want to be, it wanted to jump onto the camera or my hands or something. Do you, is, do you have any explanation yeah. for why it was doing that? I think they're just curious. They're really curious animals. They, uh, they like to investigate things. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's common behavior in them. Really? Even though I might be a predator or something. Yeah, well, I, I think they could probably tell what's a predator and what's not. I mean, they, yeah, so they're, <laughs> they're, they're just very observant spiders. Um, yeah, Denise says, oops, that goes away when we change scenes. Jumping spiders freak me out. Hello, Denise. Um, Fred, can we breed giant jumping spiders that have the electromagnetic effect of electric eels? <laughs> um, one of these, here we go. What is a bug that Denise is afraid of? Is this like, are we playing Jeopardy and we already have the answer? What is jumping spiders? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know what you were playing, Jennifer. So, um, Matt, before you you brought some great photos, um, and before I show any of yours, um, well, now, oh, not Denise. She meant your guest. She meant, so So what's a bug that um, that you, Denise, that you, um, Matt, that is there I, a bug that you're yes. afraid of? There is? <laughs> no, no, not oh. really. I mean, well, so, okay, let's just say, um, I, I, I'm not freaked out by any bug just by looking at it. There okay. are, there are things that I wouldn't want to hold. There are things that I wouldn't want to kind of mess with. Like what? Um, like I wouldn't hold a giant water bug. Uh, that you'd be in a lot of pain if they bit you and they eat, they eat water frogs bug? and snakes. Oh yeah. They get huge. Uh, and they're very, they're venomous and very powerful insects. Um, Is that what sometimes people call roaches? Um, uh, water I don't bugs, know. Or what is it that they? Well, they, yeah, they call it, some people call cockroaches water bugs, but these are actual water bugs, actual true bugs. And actually, we forgot to talk about that before. The true bugs are a type of a specific type of insect, and right. we'll we'll see some true bugs. So, uh, but yeah, they uh, there are certain insects that and and critters that I wouldn't handle because I would be afraid to handle because I don't want to. Uh, but as far as like getting up and looking at it or seeing a picture of it, no, there's yeah. really nothing that gives me heebie-jeebies. It's there's something I'm weird. That's all. The Florida <laughs> Florida water bug is that a? They they have them in Florida. We caught some in Florida, and they're the ones we caught in Florida were almost three inches long or so. And wow. uh, yeah, they're they're very large. Do you love the praying mantis? Do you love Mothra? <laughs> uh, I, love, I do, you but know they're, I love mantis. I love I love Mothra more than mantises. I love mantises, but they're they're a little too popular for me. <laughs> okay. So, you know, though, okay, so before we show uh, your photos, I was saying that uh, that all the time I take pictures of something, and occasionally a friend of mine asked me uh, asked what a bug is, and I forwarded the picture to you. You identified something for a friend of mine in Canada once. But um, the other day, I was in my yard, and there was these two bushes right in the front, and... I just started looking in. I didn't see anything, but it was a nice day and spring is coming. And I had a feeling and I literally said to myself that in these bushes, I'll bet there's at least one interesting thing. And I actually thought I was going to find a little anole, a little lizard, mm -hmm. because they're really cute baby ones. And it just seemed like it was about time that I see one. And I saw nothing for the longest time. And I found no insects exactly. But then I saw this. Mm-hmm which I believe has been in the same place for several months. So you said, so tell me about this. Yeah, so that's uh, the egg sac of a black and yellow garden spider. So um, at least that's what it looks like to me. Um, the, these overwinter is eggs. So that's why you don't see the black and yellow garden spiders during most of the year. It's only really during the kind of summer and fall that we see them at their biggest. Uh, but this hat, this egg sac will hatch soon. 
and there'll be little tiny spiderlings in there that'll get out and only a small percentage are going to survive. And then over the next few months, they're going to be still pretty small and you might notice one or two here or there, but um, it's not really until kind of midsummer that you start to actually see what they are, uh, see yeah. them because they get a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then that was in one bush and in the other bush, the only thing I found, I was like, oh, what is this? I didn't even, and I was like, well, that's like a weird looking cocoon like thing. I think that's a slightly better picture. I'm not sure. But um, uh, this, I didn't expect much when I sent you this picture and I was very pleased with what you told me. Yeah, it's the uh, egg case of a Carolina mantid, which is a yes. neat one because it's a, it's a native one. It's a native mantis. Many of the large mantises that are in the U.S., at least in the East, are going to be non-native species. Uh, so this is one of our, it's a smaller species. Uh, this is the one that actually the, the, the non-native species don't do that whole classic uh, female cannibalizing the male thing. But this one does. So I guess that's good. <laughs> not, not, so, for, not for everyone that emerges from there, but yeah. <laughs> there's no telling. To me, it seemed hard and dry like it was dead, but you said no, that's just what it is, and it could hatch at any time. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks intact to me, and, and they do, they, they're meant to be hard and uh, kind of camouflaged. The, the female creates that, it's called an uthika, and cockroaches also create an uthika because they're close relatives. Uh, as do only the primitive, really, really primitive termites. But um, it's a technical term for an egg case in this group. And the females have special glands in their abdomen that create this kind of frothy foam that then hardens, uh, kind of like insulation foam that we even use. Uh, and so they, sh they should be that hard. Um, uh, it's to protect the eggs. Excellent. So although hey, although there saying... are, I have actually reared uh, parasitoid wasps from those. So there will be wasps that come into them sometimes. And oh, and it could ruin sting them and mantis. Well, experience. you get wasps out of it. You get pretty wasps out of it too. <laughs> I want mantids. Kevin says, I have a wolf spider that's been living in my shed for a couple years. She's quite the thing. She'll look at me sometimes and just watch. And when she has her egg sack, I stay away. Now there's a whole family living in there. Well, that's well thanks for respecting her. <laughs> yeah they deserve know, a respect yeah that's the thing i really like about the praying mantis it's that how many bugs can like turn their head and look at you like they they can swivel their head that's fairly rare is that unique <laughs> yeah mantises are one of the few insects that can do that i mean there are other insects that can kind of turn their head completely around like a bobblehead yeah. but uh but yeah mantises they're they're pretty good at turning their head around and looking around so, um, oh yeah, so in terms of that too, uh, Fred asked native to what geographical, we're talking right here in North Carolina, I'm in Raleigh, we're both in Raleigh, North Carolina. What's the address so, yeah. of that shrubbery? <laughs> we're not giving that to you. So, so the uh, Carolina mantids, even though they're called Carolina mantises, uh, they are found over most of the Eastern US at least, maybe even West. There's, there's another species in the genus out West, uh, but it's pretty broadly uh, it's pretty broad ranging on the eastern part of the U.S. All right, so now let's let's dig in, and um, these now the the rest of the photos we look at will be Matt's photos. Those were my little camera pictures that I took. Some other time I'll have Matt on, and we can talk about some pictures I've taken. But um, I asked Matt. We looked at some of his pictures together, and. I pointed out some that I was interested in, and then Matt made a lot of selections. And so this was one of yours. So what are we starting off with here? What is this? So I wanted to get some of the strange oddball ones out of the way first, because these are things that most people wouldn't see, or if they did happen to see them, they're going to be like, either guess it's something completely different or just not have any clue what it is. So what do you, well, what do you think this is? What does it look like? Um... I mean, I don't know. You know, it, it, it looks like, what do you call it, millipedes or centipedes, or it has it has those little pincher things on the back, uh -huh. like, like earwigs or something. Yeah. And so it has a very prehistoric look. That back end, that's, those are insects that kind of freak me out a little because they're so weirdly <laughs> prehistoric looking. And so, yeah. and then I was thinking, 
I remember something I'd never heard of, but you found in a lot of the homes, in the arthropods in our homes, were, were wood lice. Yeah, those are crustaceans. Those are those are like roly polies and things like that, or wood lice. But People might not this know one, that, but those roly polies, those are literally crustaceans, aren't they? Yep, yep, they are crustaceans related to shrimp and crabs. Um, these, though, are related to insects, but this is the one non-insect hexapod that I have here. So it has now, six legs, and that's what we yes. usually say insects have six legs, but this has six legs. It's not yes. an insect. Well, and 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 it's been, it was treated as an insect for a long time. This group, and uh, so this is a diplurin. This is a a gepigid one. This this group of diplurins have the forceps like uh, the the they're called cerci. These little tips of the abdomen, these little tails, and yeah. these they're forceps like. But another group of diplurins have kind of antenna like ones. So this one's it can be a predator. This is a this is a fairly large specimen. It's uh, about half an inch long, and they even get more than an inch long in some areas of the world and they're monsters but these in these hexapods i should say non-insect hexapods uh they differ from true insects in that they have internal mouth parts so their mouth their head basically has a cavity and they have these really strange simple mouth parts in there and um they also have a lot of weird other things like all their antennal segments are mus musculated all their there's some other things with parts of the body just weird things that you wouldn't really think of uh that are make them different so that's why until it was only recently that we kind of broke them out and the one group that you may you would know that are non-insect hexapods now are the springtails so you know all about you've know about springtails a little bit I think but well I I don't know much about them but I've heard you mention them I don't so what are springtails they're really they're just tiny little, little things they're really tiny little things that hop uh, Adrian Smith does have some great videos he's been working on them a lot so I definitely suggest going to see those but they're really common in leaf litter and soils super common like thousands per square foot basically but these these are, are much less common. This was the only one I've ever found alive, and so that's why I was really super happy to get photos of it. Um, nice. It's a it's and, cool critter. Um, let me see. Cause like, Fred did ask, you eat bugs? And it's like, I have, but only like as a lark on Bugfest at the museum. Yeah, um, I'm the same way. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't be against it if there, you know, if there wasn't much else, but uh, I'm not. The person, I'm not super adventurous when it comes yeah. to that, the bugs, eating the bugs. But oh, I've eaten them before. I've eaten Jennifer, live termites once, but yeah. Really? Just cleaning yeah. up around the house? It's like they're yeah, eating just, your house. You know, you should, yeah. It's fair. Yeah. It's fair. They drew Get revenge blood. on them. <laughs> Jennifer says, speaking of wasps, I annually have a nest that pops up on my deck. Is there a humane way to get rid of them if you have friends with allergies? Uh, if you get rid of the nest, you can't just move the nest. So, and it depends on what type of wasp you're talking about. You're probably talking about paper wasps, create a little inverted umbrella that they hang from. And those are, uh, yeah, well, if once they start the nest, if you were to knock that down, they'd have to create a new one. So, uh, yeah. And Denise, yes, roly polies are land crabs. Um, and Kevin Smith, are you a fan of Starship Troopers? I'm a huge fan. I love that movie and the oh, way the yeah. bugs looked in them. Yeah. That's that's actually one of my favorite movies, and not just because of the bugs. I don't just like bug movies. And so that it's just a great movie all over, so all around. So it's I it's, love it too. People were pretty divided. I think some people didn't understand the yep. level that it was a satire. I encountered someone talking about RoboCop the same way by the same yeah. director. Paul, where it's Paul like, Verhoeven, they miss. yeah, they're like, he's great. Oh, if if you're taking Paul Verhoeven, yeah, if yeah. you're taking this at face value, if you're not understanding that this is completely yep. satirical, um, which is what I love, because there are all these beautiful people getting destroyed by bugs, and uh, the the special effects still hold up, and they're it's amazing. One of the best, I, basically one of the best special effects ever in movies, and it's in this movie that's. You know, great satire, great, yeah. you know, there's some funny parts. There's, you know, so yeah, I, it's a great movie all around. I honestly. love it. When he came out, I thought, oh my God, those bugs, the, 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 the CG bugs looked so much better than the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. They just mm -hmm. looked vicious and sc it was like, well done. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's a, right. it's a classic still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All I right. totally agree. <laughs> so what do we have here? Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, I'm going to, like, to me, these look like little, like, termites or something, or... 
Yeah, so they look like termites, and that's what a lot of people might think they are. But actually, the funny thing is these are actually closer related to uh, earwigs. Apparently, these are the closest relatives of earwigs. This is a really small group of uh, order of insects. Now, we, we classify insects in the different orders, and actually a lot of my uh, pictures are going to be by order or kind of close relatives. And orders are like big groups, like all beetles are one order, and all moths and butterflies are one order. Well, this order is called Zoraptera, and that means wholly wingless. And that was because when they first discovered them, all they discovered were those pale ones on the left. And they didn't have wings, they don't have eyes, they just crawl around under the bark of dead trees and eat fungus, and you often find them in groups, but they're, they're not commonly found, and we only really have one species in most of the U.S. Um, but what they found out later was that they actually have an eyed, dark form that has wings, which is on the right, but you also see it doesn't have wings. That's because they're broken off. There's, you can actually see little wing pads there, the stubs where they broke the wings off. So the order name is now is incorrect. Um, and, but if you're lucky enough, you can find the dark forms. The light forms are much more common. And they're, that's not like male and female? What do you mean two forms, but they're the same yep. species? Same, same species. Uh, males and females could be light form without eyes or dark form with eyes and wings. And what, they, what we think is that, you know, when they reach certain densities and they need to disperse, they start making ones that have uh, the wings and the eyes yeah. and stuff so they can get out to different places. And so, yeah, so it doesn't it's necessarily wild. mean one is a, one's a male, one's a female. They're not different species. But it's, it's something that if you saw in a bark, the average person would be like, it's just a bug. And to, but to entomologists, yeah. when you see that, you're like, ooh, that's, a, that's an interesting order. Because there's really in the world, there's, I think, something like – four dozen species total in this whole order of insects so mm -hmm. when when you consider beetles have 350,000 species yeah it's a bit different so okay. <laughs> i almost we're gonna do this tell. for everyone is the head yeah. on the right is the head the little reddish area on the right is that the head yeah yeah you got that part correct that's all i got yeah oh, it's got is, is, is this one of those things that carries a bunch of junk on its back, like what, the larva. Ah. What am I thinking of that carry that you see them and they are always they're the larva of something and they have a bunch of junk that they're carrying around. I, I just want to sit here and th keep you describing that stuff. <laughs> what am I talking about? Uh, you're, you're actually, you know what? You are right on the right track. So what you're talking about are the debris carrying green lacewing larvae, lace and they do larvae. have. Yep, and so they do have jabby jaws, and they're predators, and they're out and about. So if you ever see a ball of fluff walking around, or like a little green, like uh, like lichens crawling around, that's going to be one of these that's adorned itself with all this fluff. So often to, to you're camouflage. not even sure there's a bug because first of all, uh -huh. it'll move, and you go, "Did I see something move?" But all you see is like some fluff. But if you get down and look under, it's like that fluff has little legs under it. What's going on there? And and that fluff would bite you, uh, can bite and hurts actually, because they've got venom. Now this one though is a cousin, but it's a very, very rare one. Uh, in fact, uh, this is one of my favorite photos, not because it's the best photo, it's a, it's a pretty decent photo, but because this uh, could likely be the only photo of a larva of this group of insects ever taken. Really? Um, live photo. Uh, so this is a, this is a, called a pleasing lacewing larva, and this is found under the bark of dead trees, usually dead standing trees. And see those stabby bits in the front? So like the green lacewing larva, they, what they do is they crawl around under the wood and they jab uh, the larvae of other of beetles and other insects. Really? Uh, and I actually found this in my yard here in Cary, North Carolina, right you know, 20 minutes Nearby, away from you. Yeah. I was, uh, there was a dead tree, standing dead tree, only about 10 inches in diameter. I was peeling the bark off and I saw that. And my daughter at the time was outside with me. She was very young, but I ran, I just left her outside. I ran inside, <laughs> grabbed my camera because there was no way I was missing this uh, because this was like, I was like, oh my gosh, I found, I thought it was either a dilaird or a that's the pleasing lacewing, lacewing or a barothid, which is even cooler. And I would love to see which <laughs> specialize on termites. I've yet to see one of them, but this one apparently is very rare. And uh, but you can see in the next photo what they grow up to be like to look like. 
So Oh, that's that. So that's the larva of this. Yep. yep. Yeah, that's a male. A the lot males of have those fly like co- things yeah. have freaky looking larvae. Um Yeah. Well, this is a so, lace wing. So this is this, this is, is a, a lace this wing. This is a kind of lace they, wing, but it's not like yep. those green lace wings that I see around my house. No, the green lace wings are the most common. Green and brown lace wings are the most common. You get some other groups like ant lions uh, and some of the others that are that are oh. fairly common. This one's very uncommon, and really that that thing is only about the size of your thumbnail. And it's uh, they call them pleasing lace wings because they're they're kind of pleasing looking. They they hold their yeah. wings out like that. They look like a moth. I think most people would think it was a moth if they saw it, but yeah, yeah it's a really I, cool critter. That that debris carrying lace wing larva. Why? What is it? doing with all the debris that it's carrying is it got a mission what's going on with that yeah i mean it's probably uh hiding from predators from its Mm. own predators but also probably hiding from its prey uh so it doesn't smell like one it may use those as different scents so it Ah. could be they they term that aggressive mimicry when you're mimicking something so that you can be you know like a predator or aggressive towards something but they also um i'm sure it helps them be defended from other things that want to pick them off or anything. Yeah. Okay, then. Um, is this okay, now two we're, angles yeah. on the same? Yeah, so. So now we're getting it, to my, one of my favorite groups. I got to show some pe- people some flies. So Okay, so you're really into flies, like our friend mm-hmm. Michelle Troutwine. That's mm-hmm. her specialty. But you're, you're, you're sort of, you're, Broader than that, but you really do like flies, huh? What is it about flies? Uh, I I think they're underappreciated, and that was that. That's what I always, you know, if something's super popular, it's not as interesting to me. I, I like the things that are oddballs, and this flies are a really successful group of of insects. They are, you know, over one hundred fifty thousand species known. And they're the most medically important, but they they have agricultural pests, but they're also really beneficial. They're one of the best composters of all insects. They uh, Many of them are really good pollinators. Some are really good beneficial predators or parasites. So it's just super diverse, the most ecologically diverse of all insect orders. Uh, and they're just, but they're not very well known. Everybody just, when you hear a fly, you think of just a house fly or something like that. But right. You know, a mosquito is a fly. That's what blows yeah, people's minds that. sometimes. That Michelle Troutwine yes. taught me that one, that, uh, yep. that that mosquitoes are a kind of fly. Who knew? Yeah. And so <laughs> flies are distinguished by only have two true wings, and their hind wings are these little club-like uh, drumsticks that are used to balance them in flight. And you can actually see it on the, I guess, the left-hand side of that, um, that yeah. Uh, this fly right here, uh, under its wing, that little uh, uh, drumstick kind of club, that's that's the hind wing. So this is the one that very few people will probably ever see, although they're, they're not uncommon where you can find them. Um, this is called a blepharocerid uh, fly or a net, net, net-winged midge. Um, and this is just one of my favorite families of flies ever. Uh, that's cool. And let me ask you, is... Uh... Kevin said dragonflies are creepy looking before they get their wings. But so dragonflies, are they a kind of fly? What about their wings? They have two, they have, they don't fit that definition that you just gave of a fly. Is that right? Because of the wings? Or so most wings? insects have four wings uh, or full, four fully developed wings. Dragonflies are just called that. Uh, there's a lot of things with a fly, uh, fireflies, things like that. We actually distinguish uh, the two when we write them both together. Right? They're beetle. Mm-hmm. Dragonflies are, are dragon their own things. They're their own thing. They're dragonflies. That's what they are. That's, really? Who are they related yeah. to? Damselflies. That's not even a fair answer. I'm going to kick you off the show. Um, <laughs> they're are they're just their own thing. Dragonflies and damselflies yep. are. Yep. That's they're really actually a very very prehistoric group of insects. They uh, ah, they've got yeah. a lot of characteristics. Yeah, but but these. Um, these flies are really interesting in that the larvae, I would, I'd love to get photos of the larvae and the pupae. They only develop in really on the rocks in very fast moving streams. They need a lot of oxygen. And they, the larvae are like these little kind of squat caterpillar like things that have suction cups all down their belly. And what they do is they suction cup to the rock and they kind of just graze along on that rock and eat the algae. And then when they go to pupate, they turn into this little streamlined thing that has gills that they can just sit on the rock. And these insects are interesting in that 
they're called net winged midges because the wings have these fine crinkles in them. It's hard to see. You can see the wing veins there, but not the crinkles. And that's because to escape the, the, the stream without having to drown or anything like that, what they do is they actually uh, expand their wings within the pupa. And so when they come out, they're ready to fly immediately. But that also leaves all these little creases and crinkles in the wings. Uh, now, another really cool thing is you can see, so that, that photo on the right is the, the same specimen, but uh, dried out and taken a photo of the front of the face. And you can see the eyes are divided into these two sections. So the top part of the eyes have these really big facets and the bottom part of the eyes have these small facets. The top part being that reddish area exactly. and then those darker, okay. Yep. Those, that's a lot and of the, eye going on. Big ones here and more here. Yeah, it's it's just so bizarre. And and this one's actually a female. And these the females of many of these species are predators, actually. They go and grab other flies and jab them with that beak Ooh. and eat them. But they probably use those eyes to find swarms of their mates. Uh, so they can, you know, they uh, many mayflies that develop in similar habitats have similar eyes. But it, they're just bizarre flies. They're not well known. Uh, I love the larvae. are just so cool. I mean, they're just, they tick all the boxes for me. Kind of. Yeah. We have a, Jennifer says we have a gnat type fly here in northeastern Pennsylvania that comes out around April and are gone by June. Neighbors call them mayflies, but they're tiny like a gnat. Can't be a mayfly, right? Well, they're, they're small mayflies. Uh, it's probably some kind of fly. It's probably a midge or something like that. But uh, that's, you know, that's what I do for a living is identify things. So I need like pictures or specimens when it comes to that. Yeah, so, Jennifer, you know, send me a photo and I'll get you an yeah. ID. Kim Anderson says gills on insects. Awesome sauce. Yeah. Yeah, lots of aquatic insects have really strange gills to breathe. Um, but yeah, so that's, you know, having a description is... It can be good depending, but with that kind of description, it's best to have photos or specimens and somebody could identify for sure. Now, right. this looks like, oh, so I was going to say it looks like another kind of fly and it looks like, like that one in the same way they look resemble crane flies or something. But there's something weird about those antennas that I don't understand. And there's something weird about those little tiny wings and maybe it looks like it could walk on water. Is this like a water strider? That's that's good observation, uh, but wrong. Uh, this is <laughs> this is a uh, what's called a phantom crane fly, another one of my favorite Ooh. insects around. And not all phantom crane flies look like this, but this species in the east is really amazing. They're fairly large. You know, that leg span is about an inch and a half or so. Um, and uh, they're not a true crane fly. They're actually in their own group of flies. They're not really closely related to almost anything else. And those legs, though, those those kind of uh, yeah. swellings in the legs are filled with air. And so with this black and white stripes, with those air fillings, when they fly, they do these amazing, they kind of blink in and out of, like, existence. So that's why they call them phantom crane flies, because in the really dappled areas they live, you kind of see them, and then you'll see them a couple feet away, then you see them here. It's like they're, like, they're blinking at it in and out, mm. you know, like, uh, teleporting. They're really amazing. I would definitely suggest uh, searching on YouTube for phantom crane fly. There's a few videos of them flying and it you, you could tell why they're so amazing. When you see them flying, it's just magical, really. That's and I don't say that about a lot of things. <laughs> oh, I think you say that. <laughs> you do say that. I don't, about I don't use things. the word magical. I will say I don't nope. use the word magical, but, uh, but I, magical. I could say it. They're, they're, they're magical, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. So now this is this is definitely this is a kind of fly. Yeah. See. So exactly. So this is a fly-like fly. How do we know that? How do I know that? I know it because of something to do. With, it's something about the eyes or something. But well, so a lot of the flies have a similar antennae like that. They're they're called aristate antennae. They're kind of this little kind of mitten with a little hair coming off of it, um, and uh, they're look usually spiky. Uh, this is a really pretty one. Uh, and this is a really cool one. This is a, a, a snail killing fly. Uh, although many of the species is of this one kill slugs. Is that appropriately named? Yeah. So this whole group of flies, uh, they have various relationships with mollusks. So some of them feed on clams and mussels or other things. Uh, many, some of them feed on snails and slugs. This group right here, the larvae, apparently when they're young, uh, kind of enter the slug a little bit and feed inside of it on the mucus. And then when they're older, 
they actually will just crawl around and eat individual slugs. And, and mind you, the, the baby flies are mag. Many baby flies are maggots. So they're legless. They have no head. They kind of just crawl around, and they've got these mouth hooks and a venom. This type. And so they'll crawl up to a slug and jab it with mouth hooks, envenomate it, and then eat it, and then go on to the next slug. When you and say they eat it, that little fly can't eat a whole slug, right? Like, I'm imagining a large slug and a small fly, and it just eats some of it, right? Uh, it's probably, they're fairly, they're not the big, they're not the giant slugs that you're thinking of. They're probably a little bit smaller. But okay. they, they'll eat what they want, I guess, and leave leave the rest, who knows. But, yeah. But they, then they turn out to be these beautiful flies, of course. Um, you yeah. know, the striped eyes and the really beautiful patterning. Yeah, what is going on with those eyes on horse flies and other flies? What, what, they're, all of these insect eyes are fascinating, but like horse flies and this thing, they have yeah. this other pattern thing happening. Yeah, it's, nobody exactly knows. Uh, and they can be really, they can either be spotted or striped or whatever. Um, there's even a really, really crazy one that uh, you should look up at some point, uh, Orthonevra, which they actually gave the name a uh, wavy muck sucker. So if huh. you look up wavy muck sucker, you're going to find this, but really? and it's got a super weird eye pattern, but we don't exactly know. It could be that they, uh, they see different things through that. They, it could also be that they are signaling with that. So other flies can see that eye pattern and know what species they're looking at, say for mating or something like that. Uh, I don't exactly know. And I don't think anybody really knows one okay. of the interesting things I, things I do know about it is that in dried muse museum specimens, they fade, but they found a technique recently where if you rehydrate the specimens, they get those color, those patterns back. So it's really, it's not like a chemical pigment. pigment. There's something in there structurally that means uh, you can rehydrate it and get that again. Uh, I tried to ask you before the show if you had an absolute favorite insect. Do you? And and I know you can't choose, but do you have a favorite fly, either from our well, time or prehistoric? Do you have a favorite we, fly? Well, you've already seen a couple of my favorites. So phantom grain flies okay. and uh, net winged midges are some of my favorites. And then here, there's some more flies. We'll, we'll see. I put in a few of my favorites here. So now this, I'm guessing, is this little tiny moth that I often find in my house, in the bathroom, usually in the bathtub or something around the sink. And you would think it might be a little fly, but if you look close, like I see on those antennas, it's a little fluffier. So my guess, this is a moth. And is it the moth I'm thinking of that hangs out in my <laughs> uh, house? It, it does hang out in your house, but it's a moth fly. So this is actually a uh, fly. So you got it mixed fly. around. <laughs> yep, it's a fly. Uh, but that's the one that's in your house, the other one. But this one, so these these are called drain flies sometimes, uh, moth flies, because they do obviously look like moths. They look like little moths. Okay. And they're, they're, their larvae are living in the drains. They, they feed on muck and they breathe through their butt, basically. And uh, they, they live in drains. In fact, we were repairing our shower once and I left the, train, the drain taped off for a month or two. When I opened it up, I saw these little breathing holes from the larvae in there. Now this one though is just adorable and it's beautiful. So they're not all that one that you get in the homes, but this one uh, like that, which is pretty, but this yeah. one and many others can be really beautiful. And it's a very tiny insect. There's only a couple millimeters long, but you can see it's how fluffy it is. You can also see yeah. those little blue, uh, kind of bluish pale blue spots all over its wings. Those are actually iridescent scales. So they're like little metallic scales on this little moth fly. Like on butterflies? Yep, exactly. So they're just modified CD. So Oh, so here's some crazy eyes. Yeah. So this is another one of my favorites. I was able to photograph this uh, a few summers ago. Um, this is a peacock fly. And you can tell why it's called that. They actually yeah. dance like that. They'll dance back and forth and wave their 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 wings. I will say that flies are the best dancing insects. Uh, I wouldn't say the best dancing arthropods because honestly, jumping spiders are really, really, really good dancers. And I think okay. they're better than flies. 
But of the insects, the flies are by far the best dancers. I don't feel so. like they get as much press because I think we've all seen nah. those videos of spider mating dances that are kind yeah. of amazing and beautiful. And here it looks like it's doing the same thing, but I don't think I've ever heard of that in flies. So I know. Those those are the peacock spiders that they talk about that do I mean they're they're they deserve it. They're they're amazing. Yeah. But the peacock flies are really cool. These are related to true fruit flies. Um, and uh, but their larvae, the larvae of these live under the bark of dead trees where they feed on kind of just, you know, uh, liquids like, you know, nutrient rich liquids and things like that. They're little maggots, but the adults, this one just stood on the banister of the deck at my parents' house in the mountains here in North Carolina. <laughs> and it was just kind of, it was sucking on some bird dung. And then it was just like walking around and dancing and just, you know, I was able to get a, a nice session with it, taking these photos and it's just so cool. Uh, they can't yeah. use those wings to fly, but they, they will just put them up like that and really beautiful. Now this is a Katie did. It is. <laughs> so that's oh. a cone headed Katie did. Where's, Where's that this? from? Okay, so one day, um, we had this idea for a long time that um, there's really a great thing here. Because, I mean, if we talk, we haven't really, we've got caught up talking about all the bugs, but without, um, let me uh, let, let me stop one second just to pull up this uh one message, Jennifer says she has to run out, but she's endlessly fascinated by the presentation. We'll check out the rest <laughs> later. Thank you, Matt. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> and then look, this one just says she's entered that. And then Kevin says, at least I thought it was a Goliath moth. Oh, first he said, my daughter and I came across a Goliath moth caterpillar and it reminded me of something from Alice in Wonderland. If it was a Goliath moth. Um, okay, I'd so- I'd be curious to see. We had this idea, and I love this idea that, you know, sometimes people think to get good photos of insects, you may have to go to somewhere exotic or go to a state park. But the truth is, I think you and I both, we've taken a lot of our best photos in our houses, in apartments mm -hmm. we've lived in, just outside our house. And so one day you came over and we both spent about an hour just walking around the yard looking for anything we could find. And I, I don't have mine today, but this is one of the ones you found in my yard, right? Yeah, I included a couple for you, just two. This one was a nice nice specimen of a cone-headed katydid. Now, this, this katydid is fairly common, but it's uh, but it, I always like them. They're really cool species. Uh, fairly large, you know, it's several inches long, uh, yeah. about the, you know, the length of your, your index finger or so. Um, but just sitting there in your grass and, you know, was very patient. I got some closer up ones than this too, but so uh, yeah. Katydids and grasshoppers must be closely related. They are, yeah. So katydids and katydids and crickets are are more closely related than they are to grasshoppers, but all of them are in the order Orthoptera. So they're all closely related, but the 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 ones with the really long thin antennae and usually a long sword like uh, egg laying device and often the really noisy really really singing ones are going to be the katydids crickets oh. in that group i'm not really and aware then, of their the sounds they make but i do know the, like the ones that i find that are the big ones those big katydids that are very pretty and pointy and was there another one here yeah. oh no well, well you're but, definitely uh, you're you're definitely you've definitely familiar with the sounds if you go out in the summer at night you're going to hear all the crickets and katydids and stuff like that. All those really deafening sounds outside are almost all going to be crickets and katydids. And that, they do that types. by rubbing their legs together? Not their legs. They rub their wings together. So, oh. yeah. Yeah. So, it's a – yeah, they, they did that. I don't know who it was. There are some cartoons that did a disservice by showing them rubbing their legs together. But it's really oh. – so, they have a – they have their wings are overlapping and what they have is they have a little scraper and a little uh kind of drum of uh, a file and when it rubs against it it vibrates that little kind of drum pad and that makes the sounds and so and you can actually tell when you have a male or female because the males will have the that little kind of thing pattern on the wings to be able to do that and guess where they hear from where are their ears how do they even where hear are their ears <laughs> i don't know I don't they're guess. not on the I, I'm going to guess they're not on the side of their head because nope. <laughs> you wouldn't be asking. So are they down there on their legs or body somewhere? Yeah, yeah. They're on their front legs. Right on, you know, if you if they're holding their legs out like this, they're right here on this part. Uh, let's see. You got me messed up. You got the, this part of their leg kind of. 
Really? That, That's uh, a weird for place those types. For, yeah. I mean, I'm saying that seems like a weird place for ears. <laughs> I'm a little biased. <laughs> Well, it is, it is funny that they're able to move their ears then independently yeah. from each other. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I've never thought this hard about it. <laughs> and do we know what they're, when they're all making all those noises, are they basically just saying, hey, I'm here. Anyone interested? Is that basically what they're – is that the main message? Basically, yeah, yeah. Yeah, spending a lot of energy to do that. So, yeah. Huh. Okay. And this was also now just so people understand, that's just a blade of grass, right? Yes, yes. A very small so, blade of grass, and these are very, very tiny aphids. Yeah. And one is the mother. Yep. Yep. You can see the teenagers there too, and the little babies too. They're they're kind of different ages. Um, this one is funny so because they'll get yeah. they'll they'll let them out in little group, like so let out a couple, and then a little days later let out a couple more. So well, they, they usually, uh, when the females are reproducing asexually, they're just kind of popping out babies. And so, you know, they'll, they'll pop out a few, you know, I don't know how many per day, but obviously the ones that came out earlier grow a little bit more and than the ones that are fairly recent. Um, so aphids are interesting. You usually find at least a few in a group because you got that mother that laid all those, uh, gave birth to all those babies. Um, but this one was interesting because I took the photo and I was like, oh, those are really cool looking aphids. You know, they don't actually have the cornicles, those little tailpipes that many aphids are distinguished by. They got all these hairs. They got all these little plates on their back. Uh, and I, I was like, whatever. And I, I went and kind of processed the photo and whatever. And then when I went to identify it, I found out that it's actually a very common pest aphid uh, called the yellow sugarcane aphid. Cyphoflava, which is like a really, you know, really well-known pest. And ironically, I did not know anything about it. I'd never gotten any mm. through the clinic. And it's just like, was a pretty one. So, you know, some people may, they see that and they may hate it, obviously, because it's a pest yeah. uh, on grass crops. Right. But, you know, I see it and I, uh, you know, in your yard, in your yard. And I think it's beautiful, you know. <laughs> but other people want to go to a store and buy a bunch of ladybugs to release to eat them, right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it's feeding on grass that you don't care about, then it's not a big deal, I guess. So. Um, you mentioned the clinic. I forgot to say. So you're an entomologist, and you are employed by uh, yes. NC State. Tell me what your job is. Yeah, so I am the director and the entomologist uh, at the NC State Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. And so our clinic is a service clinic that helps people identify uh, diseases of plants, uh, so sick plants, and most people don't even know that plants can get sick, but they do, uh, or insect and arthropod pests, or just kind of questions about those, what those things are. And so my job is to identify all of the critters that come through the, the lab. So anything from, you know, typical insects and mites to spiders, and even things like woodpecker damage or uh, voles or, you know, worms and slugs. So my job is basically to help people identify what kind of pests they have, and then we try and figure out what they can do about it, if they need to do anything about it. Do you get a lot of people saying, I think I have a brown recluse spider? Uh, yeah, it happens every, you know, it happens every once in a while. Not as much as you'd think, um, but actually sometimes those actually turn out to be brown recluse spiders. Now it does. It's, it's rare in North Carolina. North Carolina but is But a lot of really... times, I've heard this from other spider people, that a lot of times people are sure they have a brown, and then it's like, but it's really nothing like a brown recluse, right? I, most of the ones I will say, yeah, it's tough because brown spiders look the same to most people. And so mm -hmm. I can understand the confusion. I do have definitely those stories of people saying, I've got, I got bit by a brown recluse, and I see it, <laughs> and I'm like, well, this isn't a brown recluse, so don't worry. Uh, you don't have to fear in North Carolina, really. Ooh. Now we're moving into this whole category of insects that I love so much. So there's a lot going on here. Do you want to explain what this is? Yeah, it uh, it just exploded. So no, <laughs> it, <looks like. laughs> it made its little bed. Yeah, yeah, kind of. that's basically what they do. So this is a this is a plant hopper nymph, the nymph of a flatted plant hopper, um, and a lot of plant hoppers produce wax. And these are covered in wax, and then they have those waxy butt tufts. I don't think that, that's not the technical term. And then they lay wax around them, and they kind of sit there, and uh, you know that's their little home where they like to rest. And yeah, feed. is it some kind of protection? What's the deal with the wax? Is that uh 
Yeah, I, you know, again, it's, it's probably, it probably masks their smell. It probably has some protection, you know, it's very fine wax. So I don't think it'd have any, any real physical protection from say a large predator, but it may also, the wax may be annoying to things, you know, it's like getting in a whole ball of fluff or something. You really, because this you is really don't like, want to. It's getting ready to leave, but earlier in its, uh, uh, like days before this, it would just be hard to see. It would be covered with that wax a little more. Yeah, um, they can get really waxy, yeah. So, okay, so, I love this. So, then the next one. Th so this is the nymph that yep. becomes this? Yep. Yep. So not too much different. It's still covered in wax. No, and it's, um, so, it's kind of fluffy. I like seeing them around. So what is this again? This is a... It's called a... They don't have a... It's a plant hopper, but it's a flatted, F-L-A-T-I-D. Name, doesn't really have a common name. Uh, Flatidae is the family name, so that's why we just use it as an adjective, like a flatted plant hopper. So, yeah, I like them. So there's so they're cool. Plant hoppers. You know, I like this whole group: plant mm -hmm. hoppers, leaf hoppers, tree hoppers. I know that they're they're so charismatic and they're so relatively unknown to most people. But they're everywhere. Leaf hoppers. There's something in the U.S. There's something like twenty or twenty-five thousand species of leaf hoppers only in the U.S. Not to mention other places. And then tree hoppers, plant hoppers, frog hoppers. Are those separate? Or frog hoppers are leaf hoppers? Frog hoppers are a different one. Yeah. So all those hoppers. Yeah. What about <laughs> them? Like, like, I mean, well, we're gonna. We see, could... I know we're gonna see a couple yeah. more. Well, they're, yeah, they're a hugely, really diverse group of insects. Um, you know, uh, the plant hoppers are more abundant and more diverse in the tropics, I would say, but they're really some interesting ones around here. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there's an invasive species, the spotted lanternfly, uh, up in Pennsylvania and Northern Virginia and those areas, New Jersey, New York, uh, that will be here at some point. It's a very large, showy, beautiful plant hopper. Yeah, but like it's, it's big, it's, right? Like... Yeah, it's about an inch long, and it's uh, it's it's becoming a serious pest. Not only you know nuisance and yeah, little, you know like yeah, yeah, like you know. I guess I, I discovered that like I love. Well, I let, let let's move forward because I know that you're yeah. gonna show some. But I was this, I fell in love with all these hoppers, and oh my god, this one I love this. So this is a nymph. What is this? This is the nymph of an Acanalineid plant hopper. So a different family. Uh, and actually, if you notice something, do you notice anything with this one? Well. Um, it does have hypnotic eyes. I will say that. They have, yeah, they have trippy eyes. They look like little tanks. They move so funny. Yeah. They move like, like awkward. Like they look like a little machine that it's like, these aren't the best legs for walking, but they can hop. And so fly. this one, if you, if you see that orange thing on it, Oh that's yeah, actually, that's actually a baby mite that's drilled into the cuticle and is sucking its blood. Serves it right because it's a pest itself, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> eh, they just feed on plants. They're not. They're really not pests. Usually, the, these plant hoppers are not very big pests typically, but so, they can be. And what's on yeah. the mite? I wonder. Yeah, it could be another mite. In. Or it definitely um, got some mites. bacteria and stuff. It's mites all the way down. So this yeah. yep. is the adult. So did you did you find this in my yard or no? That this you is an older paired. photo in my okay, old that's yard. That's an older yep. one. Yep. But yep. that's a photo on my fence in my backyard. Yep. yep. And you must have put a lot of light on it to get that black background to shut it down and get that black. Or did you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I use a flash. I use a diffuse yeah. flash. So yeah. Yeah. And again, that eye. So. That's about the only thing they have in common from this nymph to the adult is that trippy eye. Yeah. Oh, and I should mention it. If uh, in both of these, uh, so true bugs, well, the insects we can accurately call bugs, these are in that group. Although some people debate whether it should be the, just the stink bug like bugs rather than the hoppers and things like that. But bugs are known for their sucking mouth parts. So they have a soda straw kind of mouth. They have stylets. They pierce plants and suck yeah, the juices. It's, it's or they hidden. pierce insects and Yeah. Yeah. So you can see it on this picture. And then the other yeah. one, it almost, on the, the nymph, it looks like a leg almost. If you go back to the nymph, it looks uh, like it's a leg. So that middle leg is actually the mouth parts. Okay. The one that's sticking kinda, down. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 
So yeah, I mean it's hard to see in this, but very often when you're trying to take pictures of them, you see it. It's like leaning against their underside, but it's, and then they stick it in. So yeah, sucking mouth parts as opposed mm -hmm. to what's the other kind? Uh, chewing. So they they're things that chew chunks of things. And other things. So these have to. Their, yep. So these have to have a liquid diet, basically. Yeah. Now, so yeah, this was when I first learned that they were pests is because sharpshooters, a kind of leaf hopper, right? Um, mm -hmm. And they're amazing and they come in so many different colors and stuff. And I see that you've presented them in, in different life stages. Yeah. And so this is why they're called sharpshooters too. So you see what's coming out of the rear ends? Oh, in that middle picture at the top, there's a little dew drop. And at the the left picture in the bottom one, you can see the two oh. drops coming out of it. Okay. So yeah, so because the these insects specifically, they produce this substance called honeydew out of their rear end, and they're called sharpshooters because they'll it'll often be a stream that they shoot away from them. So it's like shooting a almost like a rifle or something. Yeah. And the reason they do this is because they they drink all this really sugar sugary rich water, but uh, these the insects the, have the sap from the tree, from the plant. Exactly, the sap from the plant. So they have lots of sugar and water, but they also need fat and protein because they have muscles like we do. They have, you know, other things. They have fat that they have to build up. So they have to filter out a lot of the sugar water or else they'd explode. And so what they do is they try and filter the stuff that they want and then eject out the sugar water. And this oh. is actually what many, many other insects and animals will actually come up and eat this or drink this. It's like a, a soda fountain, basically. Yeah. Is that what we're coming to next? Is that, well, we are in a minute. We'll see something. Yeah. Um, so here's one of your favorites. Which I've never seen. Yep. We'll, we'll get you some. We'll see. We'll, I, I'm going to let you, we're going to see some together. So I'm this sure. is a, so. it's called a thorn bug, but it's a kind of. Tree hopper or plant? Yep. Tree hopper. Yep. This is the oak tree hopper. Um, and actually, in this photo, you can see the little baby next to it. So the mo the mothers often stay and guard the babies. Uh, so that little thing near the near the leaf at the bottom, that little kind of red and black thing, Just that's the baby. Just above the greeny like a, green part. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the that's a very young one. Uh, that's you know not not too old. Um, this species. Uh, is really interesting. The the adults there, some of them have that thorn like process. Others don't. Some of them oh, yeah. are black. Uh, some of them are red and green striped, and others are spotted like this. And that doesn't correspond to male, female, or anything like that. We don't actually know what causes them to have a thorn or not. But when they're young, like this, this is like the teenagers. These are the teenagers, kind of. They remind me of some kind of samurai helmet or some kind of uh -huh. Japanese art, I feel like. The, they've got those spines coming out of their back. So the, the young look way different than the adults. Um, but this, this group was found on campus. This one was actually on birch uh, in the mountains. So we'll feed on a few other trees, but it's mostly found on oaks. And the other one, this one is on, from an oak on campus right outside of our building. And uh, I was able to get this twig and take some photos of them. And yeah, and you're jealous now. <laughs> okay, now, yeah, I because cause I know that they're here, <laughs> and I've never, I've seen pictures of them, and I've wanted to. Now, that was the same with this bug. Mm -hmm. I had seen photos of this amazing prehistoric little monster, and I know it's real small, and it's an ambush bug, and I had mm -hmm. never seen them until finally in Chicago. Um, and then I think I saw one in somewhere in North Carolina too, out by the in the mountains, but, mm -hmm. uh, years later, but after like, you know, sometimes when you like, like you're looking at insect photography, you're like, I want to see those. These yep. are in North yep. Carolina. I want to see them. And ambush bugs were like, oh my God. So tell me something about them. I I'm guessing they're by their name that they are predators. They're ambush yeah. bugs. Yeah. So these are a true bug. So they do have, uh, it, you can't see it there, but they have a jabby mouth parts, but it's sharp and it's used to ambush prey. So what they do is they sit on flowers oftentimes. Uh, goldenrod in the fall, if you go to see some goldenrod, they come in white and yellow, different colors to almost match the, the flowers, but they sit and wait. 
And they're technically a type of assassin bug, and they have these raptorial front legs just like a praying mantis does. And they're incredibly strong and quick. And so they'll sit there, and then you'll see one hanging onto a bumblebee. And this tiny little insect is jabbed a bumblebee, is like has envenomated it, is now sucking it dry. Sometimes they'll even do that while they're mating. I have photos of them mating and they're eating, they're just eating, you know, dining in or whatever, and they're just eating dinner. And, and mating uh, at the same time? Mating at the same time. But what, when you get to a spot where you, you can find them, you'll find them all over the place. Uh, and it was oh, one of those yeah. ones where when I saw it when I was younger, I was like, I have to find this thing. Yeah. Now, now I, now I often take photos of almost everyone I find. I, I'm, I'm, I'm reducing it now. I've got a lot of photos of them, but I can't really? help. There's some insects that I they're can't so help taking cool. photos of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a good rare one. That, uh... <laughs> oh, more hoppers, nymphs, um, leaf hoppers. One no? is. Huh. So the, the one on the left is a leaf hopper nymph. The one on the right is a plant hopper nymph. But what do you see? Well, and the one on the right is actually producing honeydew, and it's got wax coming out of the back. But there's something interesting going on. Yeah, here. what, what is, that? is that? It's I, I guess it's it? not a goiter or a tumor. I guess it's um <laughs> it's some sort of little parasite. It's not it's not a mite. So nope. what is it? Uh, the, some mites look like that when they're stuck. The the they're usually red. Uh, this is a parasite. It's the larva uh, of a type of wasp, and that black thing is actually a case that this larva makes, and it basically just sticks its head inside the insect. And then lives in the case otherwise. Like it just, uh, and it's got actually, it's called the, one of my favorite terms in entomology. The, the case of these wasp larvae is called a thylacium. And uh, it sounds like some kind of uh, yeah. Star Trek, you know, alien race or something. But uh, if you go to the next shot, next picture, that's what the actual wasp looks like. Oh. And it's absolutely one of my favorite groups of insects. These are called pincer wasps. That's the newer common name for them. They're called dryanid wasps, also dr the family dryanidae. Um, this one does have wings. Some don't have wings. Uh, and the females are one of the only, there's only two groups of insects. In fact, there's a type of ambush bug that has true pincers uh, in Asia. But this group you can find here. And the females actually have a little thumb-like process. They actually have claws like a crab or like a scorpion. And what they do is they crawl up to those hoppers. And, of course, those hoppers are really quick, you know. So they crawl up to them, and then they grab them, and then they jab them with the egg, and then they let them go. And then that egg starts to, you know, I don't know what they do if they're feeling woozy, and they wake up, and they're like, oh, that was a crazy trip and everything. And, <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then this thing is growing out of their side. Oh, yeah. And There's they can't so do anything about it. <laughs> Parasitoid wasps. Um, All right, so what is this? Well, it looks like an ant. Yeah, it looks like an ant. It's not an ant, though. No? Uh, yeah, this is the a cool little looks... wasp. Yeah. Okay, it's a wasp? Yeah. It doesn't well, have wings? Well, ants are technically a type of wasp, and it, this okay. this species of wasp doesn't have wings as females. Uh, some, some, of the, some species of wasps don't have wings at all, males or females, uh, but this group, the females definitely don't have wings. Uh, this is what's called a bethylid wasp. Um, and they are, this group is really small and ant-like, uh, but they actually pack a really powerful sting. And that's how I, I got this specimen, actually, is that <laughs> these, these were, uh, I had a sample submitted of some turkey boxes from turkey production. And they had these wooden nest boxes. Uh, and uh, what happened was the, the workers in these turkey houses were getting stung all over and these are these these are very tiny insects you can see the wood grain there they're very tiny insects but they pack a really powerful sting and what happens is these hunt beetle larvae and so the wood was infested with uh, death watch beetles and so there were all these larvae and they were making these little holes and these crawl in and they sting the those beetle larvae and paralyze them and then they grow their young on top so they'll lay their eggs a bunch of eggs on the top and the larvae will sit on top and the mother will sometimes feed them and defend them and eat on the larvae as well uh and you even sometimes have these really large larvae that get attacked by multiple females so it's like a little apartment complex where they're all oh. raising their families on this giant piece of food which is the beetle larva 
Uh, and so it's just a weird, I, I think it's just a cool little wasp, but I want to trick you as far as, you know, yeah. looking, it looks just like an ant. I mean, yeah. and, uh, but they're, they're, you know, it's something that, you know, if you didn't know, you might say, oh, these are stinging ants or fire ants or something like that. But luckily, you know, they sent them in to me and I was able to tell them these are bathylid wasps. And the reason they were there was because they were hunting those beetles. And so they had a beetle infestation. They get rid of those. They're going to get rid of these wasps. Interesting. You know, we might have more photos than we can get to today. Um, but here's yeah. quite... Okay, so this is... Some aphids we gotta get to and some, some ants. We got to get to some of them. I'll tell you which ones you can skip, I guess. Through, okay. through. I'll give you like a like a one sentence, whatever. This is one of my favorite photos, though, that I've taken. Uh, because this shows ants and aphids in kind of a different light. Because the ants are dwarfed by the aphids. And you normally right. think of aphids being tiny. But these are winter ants or uh, false honeypot ants, Prinolepis and Paris. Uh, and these are on a beech tree. And these are called giant uh, bark aphids. And they, they're harmless to the plants. They're kind of, you can find them sometimes on the trees, but they, they're one of the largest aphids, if not the largest aphid we have. And it's, it's large, actually. You can, you can obviously tell. And they get even bigger than that, the, those aphids. So, um, yeah. So it's just really cool. They're ten, sitting there tending to the aphids because they, they get that honeydew They get the honeydew. They, exactly. they get to eat some of that, and then they protect them because a lot of bugs don't like ants, so they'll stay away. Exactly. And you can see that one on the left, how it's, uh, it's abdomen is really distended. Uh, it's full of all this nectar. Oh. And so they call them, they call them false honeypot ants because, uh, they do store the, the nectar in their gut and then feed it to other ants in the colony huh. and stuff. So, okay. All right. Speed round. Ooh. This is just cool because it was a, it was a nice picture of a queen, uh, Trachymyrmex, which is a fungus farming ant that we have natively here in North Carolina. So okay. you hear about the leaf cutter ants and they're tropical. This is one that collects debris and they'll grow fungus on it in colonies, but it's just a neat. They're I farmers. Think it's just a they're neat ranchers. Type of ant. If Fred is still yeah. out there. There's some ranching going on now. <laughs> these are beautiful. <laughs> both of them. Okay. We're at the, we're at the wasps now. So we, yeah. Although. Uh, so a good segue, I guess, is that these aren't wasps, but these can sting. Both of these can sting. These are both caterpillars. And what do you think? What are you What are you thinking? Yeah, they're caterpillars. So that means that they grow up to be either butterflies or moths. Uh huh. And these will grow up to be I moths. I knew that some. I think I knew that one with the '70s hairdo, with the blow wave hairdo, blow blow dried hairdo. I think I heard that, that those were dangerous. Yes. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're very fluffy, but underneath, basically that one on the top is in the same family, very close relatives, but that's like one where it's very sparse, like it lost all its hair, but it's still got those spikes, those little uh, those little kind of bumps with spikes on them. Yeah. The little, they, they look like that's what's actually underneath the fur of that other one too, but they have just a much more elaborate hair. But anyway, they, if they... these sting you... Yeah, yeah, how do they sting you if you touch them or what? Yes, you... yes. So if you touch them with the kind of tender part of your skin, you'll get it'll be like a burn. It'll be an intense burning sensation, and and the one in the bottom is actually the most venomous caterpillar we have in the U.S. And it's and it could be you'll it'll leave a red mark for about twenty four hours and a burning sensation like like sunburn or whatever. So bad so sunburn, what are these? So. Yeah, what's that? What's that seventies caterpillar called? <laughs> That is called the southern flannel moth or a pus caterpillar or, yeah. And then the other one is called the uh, white flannel moth. And is it automatic? Do they have to sting you? Or if you touch them, you're getting, you, you are being stung? Uh, it you know it depends. I mean? I've heard that you can hold them on your hand, like where it's, I, I wouldn't suggest Underneath, this. You know, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, you know, you can't not sue me for this, but. But uh, you can hold them on the palm of your hand because it's thicker skin. But if you were to brush the back of your hand against one and actually touch the spines, well, they break and they deliver some poison. They wow. deliver venom. So, yeah. Okay. But they're really cool. They're really obviously Very cool. cool. And so these are just some pretty moths that I like. These are both yeah. fern moths in the same genus. So they're they're cousins, but you can see they're very different. And the one on the left is, is the pink shaded fern moth. And the other is a Florida fern moth. And their larvae eat ferns. And they're just really spectacular looking moths, I think. And moths get a bad rap for not being as beautiful or as dramatically mm -hmm. beautiful as butterflies. But some moths are kind of amazing. Oh, uh, there's some moths that are way better than even the most beautiful butterfly out there, I think. Like this one is really pretty. Yeah. Um, Let's take a bigger look at that. That's a moth. Yeah, that's a moth. 
Uh, that is dayfly moth uh, in the clearwing moth family. But what's interesting this is, is this is a super serious pest. This is called the squash vine borer. And people have a hard time growing zucchini and stuff like that here in North Carolina because this moth will come out, lay its egg on the base of the plant, and its caterpillars bore into the plant in the base of it. And they don't care about farming. They just want to eat that plant. And they'll basically kill a plant by doing that. Huh. So these are the bane of many gardeners, honestly. And it's just I such a beautiful moth and just a serious pest. That's so in like the sharpshooters. They come in so many colors. They're so beautiful, and they're a threat to the to vineyards and uh, yep. in California. And this so beautiful. I didn't even know any moths were any kind of threat. Now this one, no one would know. Hardly anyone would guess that that's a moth. Yep. But and but so, the antennas give it away, right? Yep. And a few other features. They'll have a, a siphoning mouth part. They have scales all over them. But yeah, it's a really good. Uh, yellow jacket mimic and this is another one the same family as the squash vine borer but this one attacks raspberries and blackberries so these actually the larvae bore into the bases of blackberry plants and they can kill a blackberry plant or a raspberry plant so they are a pest a serious pest of blackberries and raspberries which it's called the raspberry crown borer um, but again it's just such a beautiful moth uh, I've even had them resting on my blackberry bushes and all I can do is just sit there and take photos because they're just really pretty oh. and then this one is is a male of a peach tree borer. So this is, um, uh, this one actually the larvae bore into, into peach trees, obviously. But I just wanted to show the moths and butterflies are so beautiful because they have all these modified hairs that are flattened into scales. And so that one on the right is a really close up picture of the abdomen of this moth. And you can see those iridescent, almost oil slick scales all over the yeah. place. Yeah, yeah, it's really, they're really beautiful when you look at them up close. All right, so what is this? Well, those antennas look like a moth's antennas. Okay, what's the rest of the body look like? I don't know, a bug. An ambush <laughs> bug almost. Uh, <laughs> so it has wings like some kind of fly, yeah. but those antennas seem more like the headgear on a moth than a fly. Yeah, kind of. They use them to smell, but this is a beetle, actually. Oh. So this is... So those are those short wing, the short orange wing coverings are the the elytra that a normal beetle would have, and so they have these really long membranous wings. When you say this the one elytra, a, yeah. So those are the wing coverings of beetles. So when they open up those big hard wings in the front, and then the so they have the membranous ones in the back. Most beetles, the elytra completely hide the wings, and in this case, exactly. they don't at all. Nope. And so this is a weirdo. This is just a really odd one called a wedge-shaped beetle. And this is a female, and she's actually laying eggs in a flower. Now, the larvae don't actually eat flowers or plants at all, though. What they do is they actually hatch, and they crawl onto bees that visit the flowers. And then they hitch a ride back to the bees' nest, and then they drop off, and they go and eat the, the, the bee larvae. They basically, once they get, they're really fast and mobile when they're, when they're first born. Once they get to their site where there's a bee larva, they kind of shed and become this grub that just sits in there and eats the larval bees. So it's laying eggs. They're going to hatch inside the flower. These little nymphs or larvae or whatever catch a ride on the bee yep. back to its home, yep. the sanctity be, of its home, and then start it, eating its babies. It would be like if you went to the restaurant and you came home and there was some kind of monster attached to you that you didn't know was there, the baby monster. And then you get home and you tuck your kid in bed and that little monster hops off and then eats your baby, which is pretty horrific, actually, when you think about it. But it's I a beautiful know. beetle. <laughs> Ooh, what's this beautiful? Okay, so it looked like, oh, like, so like it might be like a caterpillar or something, but... It's yeah. some kind of grub? Not a caterpillar, though. Yeah, it's a, it's a leaf beetle larva. So it's a larva of a beetle. Uh, but aside from the pooping, which I happen to get in there and I, I, I'll stand by it, uh, it's just so beautiful because it's this uh, iridescent larva. You don't think of larvae as being iridescent. And it's just this beautiful oil oh, slick color. That is beautiful. And Even uh, the poop these you part can find... is kind of beautiful. Yep. Why, why kinda, is it so kinda. perfectly? It's like its poop is nicely packaged and 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 shrink wrapped. 
Yep, so they can just drop off the plant and, and all that stuff. And this is actually found on a, a common weed in our area. So this was found on Centennial Campus here in, in Raleigh. So, you know, not far it's away. It's very you can find beautiful. It. Yeah. And I love this beetle. Is this a type of longhorn beetle? No. No, not that. No. It's a... It's a... It's a... You got it. No, I, a tiger beetle? You know, not a tiger beetle. This is a stag beetle. Oh, okay. So, yep. This is a male giant stag beetle. Um, and this actually was flying into our door, like, at night when the lights were on in our house. Yeah. Uh, the larvae feed on decaying wood. So they live in dead, you know, stumps of trees or things. But it was it's a big beetle, obviously. It's a few inches long. Um, and the males use those big jaws to wrestle. But this, I also wanted to point out this, uh, this is another style of photography that I really enjoy too. And I haven't taken much lately is, uh, this wide angle macro. So you get close to the insect, but you also get to see the background in it. And it's just yeah. a different style of photography. And I, I really enjoy it, but I just haven't like gotten back to doing much with it. Yeah. That was a perfect subject for it. And here's this one we don't have to spend much time on. Okay, this, yeah, is a, a cool this is a flat bark beetle, really beautiful. You can see how flat it is, but it's really beautiful red color. It's a, it's a pretty iconic beetle you find in a bark, but not that much else special about it, I would say. It's, it's just neat looking. And then this one is a similar uh, type of beetle, uh, very distantly related, I'd say. But uh, this just is an oddball, very tiny beetle, but is really rare. This I've gotten two photos of this, and I wish I had gotten specimens of both of them yeah. um but this was in a protected area so we wanted to leave it and it's just this weird odd beetle okay. it's a salpingid beetle it's relative close relatives look just like weevils so it's, it's a really diverse family but very well very little known about them so okay what's now that you have uh this yeah. is something some pest has done you something know to this the, plant yeah but what, what's the plant what's the plant you better know what this plant is i hope you know Oh, no, I don't. Is it, why is it poison ivy? It is poison ivy. But we can feel some schadenfreude for this because <laughs> the poison ivy has its own pimples all over it. And, yeah. Uh, and this brings me to one of my favorite new groups as uh, areophyid mites, these little tiny mites. So inside of each one of those pimples are dozens of these little mites that have, when they feed on it, they cause the plant to grow around them. And so these are kind of typical looking ones. So yeah, Does, if you were to cut open- each of those little pimples, dozens of these little tiny things. Yep, and these are two different species. The one on the right is actually from a pine. So feeding on the needles of pines. The one on the left is from a fringe tree. And so what I love about these, be uh, these uh, mites is that they're very tiny. So these are only about a, a, a quarter of a millimeter long. You can see the stomates, which are those little those little lips on the substrate, are actually the breathing holes in the leaves of plants. So really microscopic structures. Yeah. So these mites are tiny, tiny, tiny. They look like dust to the naked eye, but they're really diverse. Just about almost many plants have them. In fact, the one on the left is probably a new species. Uh, oh. They're because they're the only ones that have been found to feed on fringe tree uh, were described from India. So this was from campus. So it means it's almost certainly a new, a new um, species. But yeah. really cool Regina under the it. microscope. They're yeah. So they're really cool. But then the next slide is the even more impressive ones. Oh yeah. So yeah. So these ones grow wax out of their body, and they grow these really crazy, uh, you know, filaments and plates and stuff like that. The one on the left is a vagrant mite. They call them vagrant uh, areophyid mites. And uh, that's because they crawl around on leaves and they don't do any damage. They don't cause any galls or anything like any growths like that other one. Um, but you can find these on the one on the left on uh, sweet gums. You know, the trees that create the yeah. gumballs, the, the spiky balls that you find on the ground a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so th those are on them. So just about every leaf, you'll find a couple of them. And they're so, but they're so tiny, you'd never see it. The other one was on a plant sample that came through the clinic, and that's probably a new species as well. Although there is a very close relative that looks almost identical. It's called the purple tea mite, and you can often find them on camellia leaves. And everybody has camellias all around, and you can find this mite, but you would be hard-pressed to see it. So you wanted to quiz me with some pictures, uh -huh. and... Yeah. 
So well, let's, not quiz. Uh, these are these are for you. This is this is a perfect c- comedic photo. So <laughs> so what's going on here? You tell me what's going on here. Something has bored a hole into some wood and deposited something. Or it, or that itself has the right. Why are you laughing already? It's, no, it's it's yeah. You're 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 on the right track. Yeah. But I can't imagine what it is. I there's no. I don't know. Yeah, I love this photo because we split this wood open during our bark beetle uh, uh, workshop, and it just looks like somebody shot a bullet into the wood. Yeah. But that is all one beetle. That's all the beetle, and this is called uh, Xylosandrus amputatus. Because it looks like the back end was amputated off. You can see it right. almost looks like a knife cut the back end yeah, off. But that's yeah. naturally how they look. That is exactly how they look in nature. Um, and I just thought it was a funny photo because it looks like somebody shot okay. in the wood. Okay. Ooh, is that related? No. No, nope. that's... this is something different. Now, something this new. also what looks is it? like... Well, I don't know. It could be a, a beetle or is it... Or some kind of bug. I don't know. A true bug? You, t- or... you, you tell me. Come on. <laughs> I don't know what to base it on even. I've never... I don't know what this is. I, I threw this in for you. Or, or unless is... it was a kind of hopper. is It, it could be... It not is. A leaf, but it wouldn't be a leaf hopper. Nope. Probably. Not a leaf hopper. And I forget. So it's a tree hopper? And like, nope. No. So it's a plant hopper. It's a plant hopper. It is... They These are called p- piglet bugs. Because they look like little pigs. But they also, this genus is called Brucomorpha, which means it looks like a weevil, kind of. Okay. And so this this does stump students a lot. So when people collect this, they think it's a, they think it's a weevil or some kind of yeah. uh, beetle. But it actually does have sucking mouth parts. It's a hopper. Uh, but it's just a, they're cute little bugs. They're, we'll find some one someday. Yeah. Oh, All right. Now, so what's going on here? So what's going on here? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, you got me. I don't know. I see like a little bit of a leg or something right there it, towards the on the left side. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, is this anything like related to the debris carrying larva, lacewing larva sort of thing? Not really. No, you can find these in your home. Really? I don't. Yeah, I, hope I just not. saw one. I went to the bathroom. I just saw one on the windowsill. What so, is it? Yeah, so the thing inside that 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 orange and white patterned and black patterned thing, that's a, a carpet beetle, and what they do is they pupate inside the last larval skin. So that papery kind of envelope and all those fuzz, it's is what the its larva skin. was. It's yeah, coming so out of its old skin. Yep, and so the larvae have these really long tufts of fluffy CD, these specialized CD. If you can zoom in almost on it, where you can just, uh, they look like little spears. And actually, that's a really good protection. So they're crawling around, and if a spider comes and tries to eat it, it will get a mouthful of those little spears all huh. over. It's kind of like a porcupine. Nice. And then, and then when the, the adult will pupate in there, probably also to get protection from predators because it's, it's really, you know, it's uh, vulnerable then. But you can find these in your home. They're, they were in 100%, 100% of the homes that we, we sampled. So, but you got to get them in the right stage. Okay. Yeah. Last Is one. Is this our last, last, one. last photo? These are the last, last few ones. The last, yeah, last couple set. photos together. Okay. Yeah. So this, it looks like what this is, is some kind of, I, I never know millipede or centipede. Is it, is it okay. a millipede or a centipede? It, what, yeah, it's a millipede. One. And something else? And something else. What's going on here? Is it mating? Or is it feeding? <laughs> Sometimes it's hard that, to tell the that difference would, between that would be, mating and feeding. That would be, I think it would be interclass mating then. It would be uh, pretty, pretty, pretty distant relatives. Okay, they're, they they're don't distant look enough that, that it's not, yeah. <laughs> they don't look so, that different. That, and that's one the is interesting a kind of thing. Millipede. Yep. So the thing with all the legs is a millipede for sure. The other thing, though, is not. And it's a predator of millipedes. Whoa. And they do. And it's probably, when I overturned this, I thought it was two millipedes mating at first. And then I said, ooh, okay. no, this is even more interesting. So that thing, if you go to the next slide, oh, is a, ooh. that is a glowworm. So it's a beetle. This is a beetle. And the larvae look like, this is a, this is a larva, but the, the adult females look almost identical. They, there are very few differences between the adult females and the larvae. 
and they do both glow along their bodies. Uh, so you, if you go out in the woods, and these are fairly large, about the size of your pinky almost, and uh, they are specialists on millipedes. They attack only millipedes. Uh, they, they, the, they eat them. They love them. Okay, so this is a glow worm. This uh, one is so and, beautiful. It's like, did you clean it up before you photographed it? Did you airbrush no, it? Just did you, it just it's happened so to be perfect. good specimen. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. Whenever I see this photo, I'm like, yeah, that's a clean specimen. It's so sometimes, well lit. Sometimes if it's I have so a really perfectly exposed. Yeah. Sometimes if like I have a really to, dirty specimen. Oh uh, no, you're not supposed to, to go. Yeah, yeah, compared to that, like it's like boom, supermodel. Yeah. Okay. See, you, I don't know. I don't know if I can ask you now. I can't ask you what I was going to ask you. Oh, what were you going to ask me? What do I think I was it goes into? Well, kind of, yeah, yeah. So glow <laughs> Now worm. you know, though. Now you know. Wow. So that's the male. That's the male of them. That's a lot of headgear. Yeah. So they got those really feathery antennae. And it's a beetle also, but you can see it's elytra. Those, those wing coverings are kind of strap-like. And then it's got those membranous wings. But you would never guess that that is what an adult glowworm looks like, or no, an adult male from glowworm. That, so that, from that. Yep. To that. And keep in mind, the female, when it goes to mate, it's basically mating with something just like this. That male. Now, the males don't glow. At least our males don't glow. But, yeah. So he has to see those glowing, and he'll go down and mate with her, and she probably releases some chemicals and stuff, but... He's mating with a little worm-like thing then. Yeah. Actually, it's bigger than him probably. <laughs> well, Matt, this has yeah. been super fun as I knew it would be. Um, I know that you uh, you have a lot of your stuff up on Flickr, but anyone can get to you through Twitter where uh, Bertona Maya? Mm -hmm. What is your yeah. handle? Yeah, is that is that yeah. your genus and species? Uh, not yet. Although I might have jinxed myself by naming my Twitter handle that. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So Matt Maya, Tone, that, you know, like, yeah. like even Googling your name, it's easy to find your Flickr account yeah. that has just hundreds or thousands of photos going back years. Um, yep. but, uh, also it was yeah, hard to pick. It was definitely hard to pick. Yeah, I know. I mean, we can do a completely different one. Yeah. For sure. So, um, thank you so much. And, and um, some other time we can talk about some other stuff, of course. Of course. But um, let's wrap things up because we've had a nice big talk and it's late and um, this has been a lot of fun. So stick around for a minute and I'm going to wrap this up, but don't go away yet. Great. All right. Okay. Thanks. So, Thanks for having me, Brian. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Matt Bertone. Um, again, just one of my favorite uh, entomologist. Doesn't everyone have a favorite entomologist? A favorite entomologist and insect photographer. Um, that is our show for you, and we have two more coming up this week on Thursday. I'm pretty excited. I'm going to talk to um, a neuroscientist from Johns Hopkins Medicine who studies olfaction, the sense of smell in mosquitoes. Uh, we're going to talk about insect repellents and and the genetic engineering they've done to study mosquito brains and on friday um cat warren is uh the author of what the dog knows she trains cadaver dogs cadaver uh smelling dogs jennifer says matt's my new favorite entomologist entomologist you spelled it correctly and uh, Regina says that was fun, and it really was. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, let's, let's start our theme song. And we'll say goodbye. Um, our theme song is by Logan Whitehurst. You can find him at loganwhitehurst.com and check out his artist page on Spotify. And we have tons more cool shows coming up. So thank you so much, everybody. And we'll see you soon. Watching buckaroo bonsai drive across the screen in his machine. Make him miss me of this plane of existence. Hey, his boss would say, there are customers waiting right here in a line. You're wasting time. There's a fellow here who needs some assistance. So he quit. Job at the video store. Tore off his name.
tag and walked out the door. Jumped in his beetle and the light turned.